Good morning, everybody. I right, maybe after. Well, it's not quite afternoon yet. Um, well, let's see. It's eleven. 11.55, so I guess it technically is still morning. I'm waiting for my glasses here to, uh, I'm having to wear new glasses, <laughs> so I'm getting old. Um, I'm waiting for them to detent, right? You know, this is transitioning glasses. It's a new thing for me to have to wear them all the time, and uh, today I've got my, my puppy up here at the shop, so I had to take him for a quick walk and Make sure we can sit here uninterrupted for the next couple hours, I guess, and talk about motorcycle stuff, right? So I had to take him for a little walk, and he's around here. He's around here somewhere. So uh, for starters, good morning, everybody. Um, I I appreciate all of you being here. And, uh, you know, we got a ton of votes uh, to do this, and, or, uh, and over 50%, I think it was something like 55% of everybody that voted wanted to do it today at noon. So uh, we're going to run as long as we need to. Uh, if you guys could give me a, um, if you guys could give me a thumbs up, make sure the audio and everything is coming in good. Are we coming in clear uh, before we get started? Um, I give you guys a second to respond to that. So we've got a lot of uh, guys. Thanks a million uh, thumbs up. There we go, hammering like crazy. Um, a lot of you guys. I'm trying to. Let me let me get these screens up and see what all I can see. If if you guys saw what all I had going on right here, you'd kind of chuckle. So I've got you know my laptop that's got the broadcasting stuff and both sides here, and then I've got chat windows. Then I have another monitor over here that you'll see me looking at, you know, checking the stream quality and all this type of stuff. So, um, hey guys, uh, uh, we've got a ton of members in here: Francesco, Brian, NorCal. Uh, who else is in here? Fred, Nick, good to see you, pal. Uh, I got to meet Nick for just a couple of minutes at Smoke Out. We shook hands through the window of my truck. Unfortunately, we were both so busy, we didn't have time to visit very long. Uh, Steven, bueno, good to see you, my friend. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, John is here, skunk. Uh, Freedom Rider, it's good. Everybody, we're good to go. Awesome. Uh, I think we've got one gentleman that's in here from Australia. Uh, we actually have a pretty big following in Australia. Um so you you guys know I'm probably you probably know you know I'm pretty good friends with a, a lot of people over there in the business uh, from you know Raleigh's uh, Rod, uh, Raleigh Callow who owns Raleigh's uh, over there he's a, he's a big distributor and the guys at Morgan and Wacker the Harley dealership uh, Adam Layton at APL you know also does a top fuel bike and stuff so there, there's a lot of guys over there we're friends with well I think it's about a 12 hour 12 13 hour time differential. I think so it's you know midnight one o'clock for the guys over in australia so that's cool mike jones good to see you and guys i gotta tell you mike jones has been helping us out quite a bit, bit here in the shop lending a hand uh during all this crazy busy stuff trying to get caught up so uh, a big huge thanks to mike for doing that and uh fred thank you very much um i think fred this may be the first time i've seen you sir in a chat uh thank you for being a member thanks for supporting the channel of course uh we really appreciate that there's george spain um so if you guys don't mind, one thing that I would like to do, uh, Chris Jones, 4 a.m. So uh, 4 a.m. Uh, so I appreciate all you guys being here. And so we're, uh, let's see, where are we at, Francesco? That's right, you're from Italy. Um, I, I'll, I'll stop on that for a second. I tell you, the last time I was in Italy, you know, there's been a few, handful of times that I've done a, uh, a European tour uh, a few times teaching tuning and engine building and machining and such and uh, the last time I was in Italy was at the Verona Motorbike Expo and uh, you guys you know you, you might want to check that out uh, it, at least look up some information it, it's that Verona MBE the Motorbike Expo is an incredible it's got to be the largest motorcycle event I've ever seen in my life I mean it's so big it, it takes like 10 10 facilities, huge buildings, you know, for, for this. Even, you know, like, Honda's bringing out their entire corporate staff and all kind of stuff. I mean, it's crazy. So, cheers to everybody from Italy. It's a it's a absolutely beautiful, beautiful country. So, one of the things I would like to do before we get started is um, I want to talk about cylinders for a minute. You know, the reason I'm here is to answer, your guy, answer all of your questions. And, uh, you know, we, we've had a lot of things happen in the industry uh, over, over the past few weeks. Uh, problems with the EPA, tuning systems, all this type of stuff. So I know you may have some questions about a lot of that. Um, I mean, so there's, there's a lot of things that's been going on. But the biggest reason I wanted to do this is, guys, this has just been an absolutely crazy year. It's been an amazing year. 
And a bit of an announcement, I want to let you guys know, we just crossed over 50,000 subscribers, and we've got close to 300 members on the channel. You know, you members, you guys support this channel every month, and, and I can't, you know, I can't thank you enough for that. And then the subscribers, 50,000 subscribers, we've only had the channel for a couple of years now. And, you know, when we look at our, our um, I guess you could say the type of videos we put out, you know, it's not that it's videos that are, aren't for the typical guy that, that, you know, may bolt some odd and parts on in his garage. I mean, we're talking about some serious technical stuff and, and, you know, it, it takes a, a certain person to enjoy watching that, you know, sometimes I, sometimes I fear that I'm a little too verbose, you know, maybe I give away too much information, maybe I get too technical, maybe it gets boring. But I, I feel like, you know, that's the information that a lot of you guys are, stri you know, you're really thirsty for, you know, the things that you want, the true understanding of the whys, you know. And for us to have that sort, it's because it's not really an entertainment channel, right? You know, I'm not uh, really focused too much on entertaining. You know, I just want to give good, reliable information. And, um, you know, for us, for that to be kind of the genre of our channel, so to speak, I, I'm I'm really surprised that you know that that's uh, we've had that kind of growth and and guys I can't thank you enough it's just been absolutely wonderful absolutely wonderful and we've got some an incredible stuff coming um, next year I have so many things that I'm putting in place but you know as you guys know the way I I have to operate this place you know it's like just this past week. Um, I mean, I worked 72 hours this week. Um, you know, there were two days. One was a 16 hour day and a 14 hour day on my feet all day in front of a mill, uh, doing uh, tapered main bearing conversions, boring cases and all that type of stuff. Now that I can finally get cylinders in my hands and, uh, you know, so it, it's, you know, 72 hours this week. And then the balance of my wife and my daughter and, uh, you know, between those two days, it was leave here at 1.30 a.m., uh, go home, eat a little bit, finally be able to get to sleep up at 5 a.m., you know, two, three hours sleep, give or take, and then right back in here. So, you know, it's been a crazy, crazy year. And that has, you know, that's kind of prevented me from doing a lot of the things that I want to do uh, with the channel and, and a lot of information that I want to get you guys. But as you know, customers come first. Uh, we've got to get this work out of here. And get you guys done the the parts back order situation and and um you know what what's really going on out there is is tougher than people might people might think and and that's a that's a large reason why I want to go over cylinders today cuz I know we've got some viewers that are in here now that have you know got caught in this thing I, I think uh, Brian is one of those you know it, it's um excuse me let me have a cup of coffee real quick so I want you guys to see the challenge of this because you know we don't um we don't live in a in a in a bolt-on world here right that's just that's not our style so uh let's talk about cylinders and then i want to do a big shout out for um for some guys and and like dewey mentioned here remember for 16 months how, how incredible is that and carrie lewis i'll actually i don't know if carrie's going to be able to join us he was our very first member uh from the very beginning so um so anyway, um, let's talk about cylinders for a second. Uh, let me see where my puppy is. Thought y'all might want to meet my puppy. He's over there laying down and taking a, I think he's taking a nap. Um, uh, he's a, a, a year and a half old Rhodesian Ridgeback. Love those dogs. Um, Nick's been in there at technician level. Nick, thank you very much, buddy. I appreciate that. Um, so let's, um, let's talk about cylinders for a second particularly twin cam, okay? This is a stock twin cam cylinder, all right? You can see that the, you know, the spigot here is one inch. And the actual cylinder height, and this is one thing I want to mention, so you guys think about this for a second. Uh, the a Harley cylinder height is 4.935 inches. inches 4.935 inches. Now that's plus or minus 10 thou, give or take. I've measured some at 4937, 4939. I've measured others at, you know, 4930, 4930, or 28. 
you know, so there's a big uh, variance in these stock cylinder heights, okay? And that's part of the blueprinting process. You know, when we're blueprinting one, there's a lot of factors that come into that. So let's think of how important this cylinder height is. So, you know, when we sit down and we design a build for you, we're looking at uh, various things. You guys have watched enough of the videos to know. Compression ratio is part of that, piston design, all this other stuff. So the reason, like, the, the cylinder height is so important we have to think from the center line of the engine, which is the center line of the crankshaft, right? So you have the stroke, then you also have the rod length, you have the deck for the deck height of the case from the center of the of the crankshaft to the bottom to the top of the deck of the case where the cylinder actually bolts down, you know? And the the whole idea is uh, to achieve a particular uh, p p achieve a particular uh, a quench. Okay, quench is that distance between the piston and the head, okay? And depending on the build, that can vary anywhere from 30 thousandths, 40 thousandths. I don't like to go any more than 40 thousandths of an inch, give or take. So when you're designing a build completely, and that's kind of the magic number you want to achieve, think of all the variables that come in. You know, the height of that cylinder, the length of that connecting rod, all of those things come into play. So when you start thinking of the length of that connecting rod where the piston is in that cylinder, so like when I design a piston, for example, you know, I know that I, I'm not a huge fan of low tension rings. I want to run a three millimeter oil pack. I want it to be, you know, as wide as I can get it. I also want duck rider piston pin height. That's exactly right. I want a, a, a certain thickness of compression ring. You know, and as these bores are getting bigger and the compression ratios are going higher, we want these engines to last. You know, we can run low tension rings and do pull tests and things, and you can gain a, a, a handful of horsepower by running low tension rings and things like that. But then the question comes in when you get to a certain compression ratio, certain displacements, you're going to have some blow by. You know, it, it's relative to what RPM a person rides in for a period of time. You know, it, it's all of those factors that come in. Uh, Dale, Dale asks, is quench the same as squish? Yes, sir. Um, that is the same thing. So the, uh, the other aspect of that is the actual geometry of the piston itself. You know, I like to, uh, when I design our pistons, I, I like to run as long of a skirt as possible, okay, uh, for piston stability, right? So let's think, and, in, 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 you know, so there's several goals we're trying to accomplish, but we're also limited by geometry. There's only so much physical room inside that case, so then when we make the move over to four and an eighth bore, you know, non-stock cylinders, uh, four and an eighth bore for, say, 117s, uh, if you're using a four and five eight stroke, then that would be a 124, or let's say if you're doing a 113, that's a four and three eight stroke on a 4060 bore, or you're doing a, uh, doing a 120, that is a, a four and five eight stroke on, or it's one format. You can do it anyway. A four and five eight stroke on a four hundred sixty bore. Uh, things happen because of that long stroke, and we, you know, we want that piston stability and such. One of the things that happens is that spigot now gets longer. All right, that is about an inch and a half, and that varies. It's a half an inch longer. So this half of an inch that you gain right here. Uh, allows for, again, the extra stroke. It also allows you to run longer piston skirts and that sort of thing, right? So, um, basically, uh, there's been a... And it's still, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Where It's a supply chain issue. Domestically supplied uh, uh, ductile iron, like for the liners and such. We also have to remember that piston rings are made out of ductile iron as well. So, uh, you know, the supply chain shortages have created some issues. And so uh, the, the challenges are, you know, like, for example, I'll, um, let's digress for a second. So you guys, if you can give me a thumbs up, it, you, you know, you understand the geometry and the, the rod links and piston compression heights and all those things to get that. So let's start with the basis of that. Is everybody, can you guys give me a thumbs up? Do I need to explain anything uh, better on that? Everybody on it? Okay. So everybody, Duck Rider gives me a thumbs up. Okay. So then what we move into is, you know, where um, uh, George asked the question, do piston ports really help expand the compression ring? I'm going to answer that question, and then I want to continue forward. 
Uh, so, George, yes, they absolutely, it's gas porting is what you're referring to. Uh, gas porting a piston, you know, it basically you're taking combustion pressure and then through those holes that are in the top of the piston, that combustion pressure goes through those tiny holes and then forces the piston ring out further and can help seal the ring better. Uh, the problem is, is when you're doing that on an engine, that's going to be primarily ridden on the street because you get carbon buildup. You know, those holes are very small. They can be 20, 30 maybe even 50 thousandths in diameter. So, and, you know, fairly rapidly under street use, those holes fill up with carbon. Well, once they fill up with carbon, you lose the benefit of that. So, in a lot of cases, gas porting a piston is really only helpful uh, in an engine that, you know, is basically going to be torn down on a frequent basis, you know, that you can clear those holes out and things like that. So, there's, it's a, it's a variable, but I hope that answers your question. So, okay, so everybody understands the, the challenges with the cylinder heights. So, one of the things when I design an engine for you guys, um, I don't like to design an engine in such a way that it requires you to have very specific one-off proprietary parts. Okay, I feel it's responsible engine building because, you know, if you ever had a problem later on down the road and you needed to get another cylinder or you might need to get another piston or you might need to get a set of gaskets, a base gasket or a head gasket or something like that, then, uh, you know, I don't want the components in this to be so proprietary that you have to essentially rebuild your entire engine if you had a problem. Okay, so in doing that, that creates a lot of challenges along the way all right so uh let's let's just go back to the cylinder height for example and i'll give you guys a little bit of history so remember i said that this stock twin cam cylinder is uh four inch um four inch 935 is the height on it okay well when you bore a case to do a 4060 bore cylinder for a 113 or a 120 or you bore it to uh for a four and an eighth bore cylinder to do a um you know a 117 or a 124 when you bore that case these cylinders are typically sealed with an o-ring on the bottom and a land that's in the case there's no gas base gasket that's required well when you bore that case you no longer have a land anymore that means that you now have to run a base gasket under that cylinder now harley uh, i say to some degree established a standard uh, no, I don't even want to say that because they didn't establish a standard. It was done long before they did it. But anyway, when you bore the case, that land goes away. Now you have to use a gasket. Well, so in my thought, I figure, well, wait, if we need to use a 20 thou base gasket, but we want to keep, you know, the rods virtually standard that you could replace a rod if you had to, or, you know, we want that 30 to 40 thou height, you know, all the other variables that I mentioned, that means this cylinder has to be 20 thousand shorter, right? So any of the cylinders that we had made from Delcron many, many years ago, and then the ones that Jim's were making for us, um, those cylinders were made 20,000 shorter. That would keep all your stock heights the same, allowing you the variability of whatever you needed to do later on with that engine's life. Uh, but that would keep the heights standard. You use the 20,000 base gasket, and then you're good to go, right? Well, with all this stuff that's been happening, domestic supplied liners and all these other things, we basically, it was a shock to us, a surprise. And so what I've been trying to do is achieve a lot of goals with a limited supply of what's available, right? So that brings these cylinders into play, all right? And so one of the things is this cylinder right here, this is how we've had to do this, just so you guys know. Uh, this cylinder is 5 inch 12 thousandths tall. 5 inch 12 thousandths. That's a lot. Okay. So the manufacturer here, they want to keep you proprietary. Certain rod lengths, they want to use their rods, their pistons, and everything else. So, but we don't want to do that, right? We don't want short piston skirts. We don't, we don't want all of those things. We, we, we want long skirts. We want fat rings we want you know three mil oil ring packs we want all of those things so we're again limited by geometry right so um so let's see what we have to do let's think about this second so what we've had to do uh you guys are gonna you might be uh you might start to understand a lot of things with this so what we have to do is we have to start with this cylinder that's over five inches tall okay 
Now, if you notice at the top here, this cylinder comes to us. See how thin this area is up here? And when you get to another side of it, you can see how thin it is. It's right at the fin pack. So that means you can't machine that extra off this cylinder. So remember the distances we're talking about. We're talking about close to, you know, what, almost 60 to 80 thousandths difference in cylinder heights. Okay. So you see that. Now, then we look at the bottom of it. All right. Think about the cases have just been bored. This cylinder's too tall and there needs to be 50, 60 thousandths plus cut off of it. Well, that means you have all of these holes for the studs which there's a shoulder on the studs. You notice there's a counter bore there. All right, then you have the holes for the dial pins that are machined to a certain depth. All right, so basically what it comes down to is that we're forced to now take this cylinder, put it in a lathe, shorten it, but when we shorten this, those dial pin holes and these stud holes are now shallower. So all these holes are machined shallower to make for all those clearances. Well, now the spigot is too long the spigot has to be turned down, okay? That's a lot of stuff. Now that's not the end of it. One of the things that we discovered in testing is under heat, how these cylinders can change shape. So I need to counteract that. So what's happened is I want you to look very closely, see the color of that spigot. That's how it comes. And you'll also notice this is a rough bore. Well, you may not be able to see it on the camera. So this cylinder is coming rough, okay? That's too tall. So then what has to happen, I want you to look at the color of this one. See that gold color? All right, now you see the base, how it looks shinier, and then you see the top, okay? And notice that dimension right there, 4.875, okay? This is a cylinder that we're using in a 117. The reason for the gold color is when this cylinder comes in and I take the, and that cylinder is placed in an oven and that cylinder is placed in an, you know, an oven or a hot plate 300 degrees for about four hours. When you pull it out, it's crooked. So then that cylinder, and that's the reason for the gold color, is it's baked to season it. Then that cylinder is put on the lathe. It's trued up top and bottom. And then now you have a truly square cylinder because it changes shape in that oven when it's seasoned. Now you have a truly square cylinder. But once you have a truly square cylinder and you realize how much you've had to cut off to get it perfectly square, remember I said that this starts out at over 5 inches. This one is now at 4875. So if you do the math, it's quite a bit different right? to get that cylinder squared up. So now that that cylinder is squared up, it can then be bored and honed. All right, so that process of going through, as I'd mentioned, the dial pins and doing all these other things. And so that's, that's been the challenge. That's been a lot of the challenge with cylinders, right? Is, has been ensuring that we've got a good, straight, perfect bore, that we have close to standard heights relative to rod length and bore and stroke ratios, uh, that we have the proper quench. And then, as I'd mentioned on this first cylinder, which is the stock one, okay, needing to be essentially, well, starting out at 4,935 minus 20 thousandths because now you have to run a base gasket, so it needs to be 4,915. Well, now this one is at 4.875. So our friends at Cometic were kind enough to do custom aluminum shims for us as well as base gaskets on both sides to now get this cylinder back to the height that I want it to be, which is 4915. Okay, so basically what will happen on this one is we'll run the 40 thousandths aluminum shim with a 10 thousandths base gasket on either side, and then we'll have our 35 thousandths quench and we'll have our perfect engine. So that has been, that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? <laughs> So, uh, it's, uh, it's been crazy. So, um, uh, let me know what your thoughts are on that. I'm going to skim through here and see what questions you guys have. Um, all right. So, uh, Joe, I snuck up on you. Magic. Uh, please give us your opinion on all aluminum Nicosil coated cylinders. Um, you know, this, uh, this is opinion. I, I've, um, I, I, I personally, 
have have never been a fan um and and i'll just leave it at that uh you know, there's a lot of engines out there that have Nicosil stuff on them that have, you know, been very successful. Uh, but it's just not, it's not something I like personally. So uh, we'll move on from that. But good question. Uh, Joe, will the baked and true cylinder remain uh, once true, once it goes into the torque plates? Yes. Uh, so it's a matter of really settling that liner into the cylinder and letting it change shape and all that type of stuff. So... Uh, you know, you'll measure it out of torque plates, measure it in torque plates, and typically what you see is, you know, that barrel in the middle uh, from compression or expansion of about a thou to a thou and a half instead of three and four thousandths. So yes, they do stay true from from there. Uh, uh, Chris you says, wow, Francesco, necessity's a mother invention. Amen to that, my friend. Good grief. Um. Uh, Dewey, uh, laws for every action equal reaction. Take away, you must add back somewhere. That's absolutely true, sir. Uh, so, guys, if if you want to start firing off questions, that was kind of my thing on uh, on cylinders. I guess you guys, did you hear about what's happened in the tuning world lately? Uh, have anybody heard about that? I mean, it, it's kind of spread like wildfire. We we knew about it a few days ago, and uh, and and then it's it. I didn't think it was going to go public as rapidly as it did, but then it it, it absolutely exploded. Uh, let's see, Chris, you when you bake the cylinder, uh, is that like stress relieving? Yes, uh, stress relieving, tempering, uh, you know that sort of thing. So do we not include Duck Rider? Yes, Brian Rib, no. So basically, um, the uh, uh, the EPA stepped in and they they came in with a sledgehammer on uh, on tuning, uh, uh, non EPA compliant tuning systems basically. So I I can't I, I I'm not privy to say. Uh, everything that I know, but if, you know, basically what's public at this point is that uh, they they you know they came down on one tuning company pretty hard, and that company's decided after the first of the year uh, to, um, to to basically kind of get out of the tuning license business and that sort of thing. And uh, so you know, there's still other tuning companies left, but the it's basically the EPA coming in and trying to limit you know how you can tune performance engines and stuff like that and and for for uh, I can give you guys let me get a sip of coffee first oh speaking of that who who's here from Australia look at this cuff I got here Raleigh Speed Shop right who's here from Oz the land down under so my good friends at Raleigh's uh, John who runs it and then of course a uh, uh, Raleigh Cal. Uh, Colin, who owns it, uh, sent me a coffee cup and a t-shirt and all that kind of stuff. They're a good guy. So, anyway, uh, so they came down on them kind of hard. So here's, let me, as you, you'll probably, you guys may Google this or whatever and see what you can figure out. So th this really isn't anything new. This uh, EPA thing, it came down, if I remember correctly, it was back in 2016. Uh, there were a couple of companies that got hit pretty hard. And, and basically what they did is they negotiated some sort of fine and then, you know, that was it. And they kept right on rolling with virtually no effect. Uh, there were some companies I was involved with as well um, on the development side of things that also got hit. And so it was uh, basically the same sort of thing. You know, negotiate the fine, you pay it, and you keep on trucking. But, uh, you know, it's still up in the air. I, I'm not going to claim to know everything about what's going on but what i can tell you uh chris jones is from sydney beautiful city uh chris that you know chris you just hit on a very specific point that epa killed the diesel tuning world i was going to touch on that in a second um and so uh, let me answer a couple of questions real quick and i'll keep going with the cpa thing if you don't mind uh norcal's asking uh, pretty. He's got a 01 soft tail. Engine's been pumped up a bit. No documentation. And all of a sudden, I got smoke coming out of rear cylinder breather. Any idea why? Uh, I would do. You know, it's that that kind of that quick physical. You know, do a leak down, a cylinder pressure test, uh, bore scope the inside of the cylinder. That's going to give you a good indication. Um, and then from there, it could be valve stem seal. It could be a major problem. It could be relatively minor. It's kind of hard to say, but that's where you always start, bud. It's, it's cylinder pressure, leak down test, bore scope cylinder. Have a look, and it gives you kind of a good idea of the health of where to start and go. 
So anyway, on this EPA thing, you know, if the EPA did come down, you know, there's a lot of folks that are just absolutely freaking out over this thing. And I, I look at it as, as, to some degree, responsible engine building. So it's, uh, you know, basically it's, it's putting together combinations of engine parts that would allow you to tune within an EPA-compliant tuning system. So you may not be able to run cams as big as you used to, valve sizes as big as you used to, you may not be able to tune it as rich as you used to, but you know there are ways to design an engine that it could be tuned with an EPA compliant device. You know I don't think it would get as as extreme. Um, Joe, <laughs> Joe mentioned you're saying I'm extremely grateful my tuner snuck in under the EPA wire. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so the um, um, I forgot where I was going with it. Sorry, guys. 72 hour, 74 hour work week. I'm tired. Oh, yeah. The responsible engine building thing. You know, for the, for you guys, I know a bunch of us are old guys. So let's roll back to the mid 70s, right? So, I mean, I mean, how awesome was a, you know, a 75 455 HO Trans Am? Those cars were awesome. And they made a whopping 160 horsepower, right? Smog pumps, EGR valves, all that stuff. But, you know, over the years, they figured out, you know, I think if Mike's watching, I mean, you know, Mike's got a several hundred horsepower car now, and, you know, it's would be absolutely EPA compliant. So it's, you know, technology changes things. So what it, what it comes down to is we might not be able to make quite as much power as we used to, but in responsible engine building, there are ways that things can be built uh, that the engine can be safe and be able to comp tune with EPA compliance. You just might have to use a different combination of parts, compromise a little bit here and there. So by no means is this the end of the performance engine world. Uh, there's no way. Uh, this is what's always happened, you know, for years. It, it's, you know, either the motor company will do something and change something, or, you know, EPA will come in or something like that, and then the aftermarket is full of brilliant people. We design around it. We come up with solutions. That's what we do. It's a cat and mouse game. It's been that way for forever. That's what we do. Um, so it, it's not the end of the world. There's no need for people to absolutely freaking panic over this thing. So um, and unless you live in California, that's a different story. But, uh, you know, carb compliance and such. But um, all right, let's get to some some questions. Um, Steven, uh, the diesel truck guys, and that was to jump back on that. Yes, few, quite a few years ago. Uh, you know, with the diesel thing, I, I'm not going to say they started it and it was their fault, the diesel industry. It was just, you know, a, a big industry that was hit. So uh, it was really came down to, you know, tuning, doing DEF deletes, diesel exhaust fluid deletes, and doing EGR deletes, getting the regen procedure out of diesels, doing all that type of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, the EPA came down hard on diesel tuners and shops that were doing those procedures. Uh, they came down pretty hard and heavy on them. So... Um, internal racing, we push to be efficient, all race truck. Hat. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can build performance engines that are very, you know, very efficient, if you will. They they may not be as, you know, our biggest challenge is heat, guys. We're dealing with air-cooled engines. They're still primarily air-cooled engines. So, you know, our challenge is managing engine heat, and we have to do that with fuel and timing. So when you limit the adjustments of fuel and timing, you're limiting our ability to keep those engines cool. Well, that's when things like oil coolers come in and fans and, you know, all this type of stuff to help mitigate all that heat. So, um, yeah, Chris, 74 Trans Am SD was the last of the 70s muscle cars. Yeah, Pontiac held in there for a little while longer than everybody else, you know, and even Mopar succumbed to it, unfortunately. And uh, improvise and adapt, yes. Holden, baby. Yeah, Mike Jones has a Holden. What we would know in the... Well, a Holden Commodore over in Australia. And what we would know here, it's funny, it basically the, the car looks kind of like a, a Malibu, but, I mean, it's a, it's a hot rod. It's essentially a Corvette and a four-door. <laughs> so when those cars got imported here, I, I first met the Holden Commodore when I was over in Australia. And then I think, and Mike, you can correct me on this, I think they quit making that car in 2017 was the last year. And a handful of them got imported here as the SS. It's just a Chevrolet SS. And so it's a really, really cool car. Um, so Neil asks, can you still have a Stage 2 with low torque and PV tuner? Yes, sir. It, it all comes down to the right combination of parts, the right cam, responsible tuning, 
the engine may run a little hotter, but those are things that, you know, again, there are solutions for that sort of stuff. So it's, it's nothing to, for people to absolutely, absolutely panic about industry wide anyway. Um, and Chris, you right. Gail Banks figured it out in the diesel industry. That's right. I mean, just like Gail is to the diesel industry, there's a lot of very brilliant people in the motorcycle business. We figure this stuff out that that's all there is to it. Um, so, um, so that kind of covers that. What other questions have you guys got? Uh, you know, I wanted to talk about the cylinder thing, wanted to talk about tuning and, uh, you know, we're just, we're just running wide open here at the shop. I'm so excited about the things that are coming. We've got, uh, you know, if you mentioned I was doing an, going to do an engine build series absolute from the crank up, let me check from crank up on Evo shovel head and pan head. And uh, I have the Evo, and I have the shovel head, and then uh, the next is the pan head. So I'm still in search of a, a you know, known good pan head uh, to do that case up, and that's going to be with gems, of course. Uh, I'm going to show that what, what I'm really excited about with this, I mean, you know, guys know I have a full machine shop and stuff. Well, a lot of times, a lot of the gems tools that they have uh, are designed for a guy that wouldn't have a machine shop. You know, they have safeguards in place with their tool design and stuff that can, uh, you know, like, for example, they've got one tool that it's it's got a wonderful fixture. It's a great tool. And it to, to uh, uh, oversize your breather port of an Evo or, or a shovel, you know, that breather port there where, where the breather gear goes. And, uh, you know, it's got this really nice fixture, and you could use it really with a drill press and actually... You'd be okay to use it with a hand drill, too, if you needed to. So the idea with that whole series, and it's going to run a year or two, really, is to show you guys that the ways that with, with you know, let's say if you didn't have a you know, big machine shop and access to a lot of these tools, how you could, you know, potentially build an engine in your garage. I'm going to show you how to do every step of the way, and that's just one element. Um, uh, we're going to continue on with the painting stuff. We're going to start looking at all kind of different facets of, of the motorcycle side, Um you know, I've got uh, a couple of fellas that have signed on for middle of next year to bring in uh, some shovel heads. We're going to do complete restorations. I think one of them is a 78 shovel head, but he wants to do a restoration on the entire bike. You know, so a, a lot of expansion, you know, with what I'm wanting to do. I, I want you guys to see that there's a lot to, a lot more to this stuff than just building engines, right? So uh, let's get to some questions. Um Let's see. Older tuners will not be affected by the new EPA regulations, correct? That is correct, George. Uh, it would be a, uh, as I understand, a lot of this stuff is effective either in January or February or something like that. Um, you know, there have been some cease and desist letters, and so I'm not sure the exact date. But if you have an older tuner in place, you have a, an older license, as it stands right now, none of those would be affected. Okay. Uh, so Nick Hildebride stock O2 twin cam, 102,000 miles. Wants good freshing up this motor to give a little more power and not be overly expensive. What cams, etc. 50, 50 riding two up. Uh, the, the, um, one big thing you have in your favor there, Nick, and thanks for supporting the channel, buddy, through membership, by the way. Uh, one big thing you have in your favor being an O2, O2 was a great year for Harley. You know, you still had your, your tapered main bearing, and uh, you had square top rods on the crank. You know, the cranks were generally very good with low run out. So you have a lot of things in your favor, but 100,000 miles is a lot of miles. So, you know, freshening up could be as simple as if you guys watched our recent video on rebuilding the Evo heads, you know, basically doing the same thing to your twin cam heads, just kind of going through them, see what they need, fix what's, fix what's broke, or, you know, uh, address what's broader than it needs to be. Uh, you know, that's one way to look at it. Uh, drop a nice cam in it. And, you, you know, the interesting thing is to give a little more power. What what a lot of folks fail to realize, you got 100,000 miles on that bike. There's no question that bike makes less power now than what it did 50,000 and 75,000 miles ago. So just freshening one up is going to give you a little more power. You know, you lose power slowly over time. You don't notice it as much. So it could be, you know, maybe taking it to a 95-inch you know, get compression up to maybe 10 to 1. That can be relatively simple to do without too much head work or anything. Get it up to 10 to 1, drop a nice cam in it, uh, bore and hone cylinders, clean up the heads, new guides and valves if it needs it. 
uh, it'd make for a nice little setup and, and, you know, inspect the oil pump and all that. So, uh, you know, that's good. Um, you know, I've heard of some of the early bottom ends lasting a hundred, 150,000 plus miles before you got to start looking at rods and bearings and things, but, uh, it's a hit or miss. So that's a good, uh, you know, a, a maybe a good, a good way to get you started. Uh, Steven, how long is my rear Dunlop going to last? 500 miles you break in and 130 miles asking for a friend with I, I i know how you ride steven and i know what's in that bike so i would imagine that rear tire's not, <laughs> not gonna last very long um brian webb older licenses that is correct sir older licenses as it stands right now you should be fine with no issues whatsoever uh joe but he wants to get a low end boost as frugally as possible. Stock 2018 Street Glide 107, talking about 468. What supporting cast would he need to surround with it? A lot of that, Joe, as we've talked about, even when we did your build, sir, is a lot of it depends on the right hand. You know, Cam's going to add, you know, it's, that's a great Cam choice, by the way. You know, that's a really good one. Um, and, you know, a nice little boost to low, low end torque, low mid range. And, uh, I don't think it would be enough for him to have to do anything anything major. His stock clutch should be fine. Uh, I don't really see a need for him to change injectors or throttle body or any of that type of stuff. So, you know, that's a really good one. And then um, inspecting his oil pump, his cam plate, just seeing where he's at overall. But that's, uh, you know, that's a really good choice. And and maybe, you know, just go with the cam and and let, let that be the end of it. <coughs> Uh, so Terry mentions, have a better understanding on all the work you do with cylinders, how many hours you spend on a set, um, start to finish. Yes, it's it's a tremendous amount of work. Basically, what it used to be with, uh, you know, we had our, we were able to have our cylinders custom made for us. And, uh, you know, Jim's were making our cylinders for us for quite some time. And then Delcron was making them for us for a long time before that. And they, they came to us sized perfectly and all i had to do was finish hone them uh to you know to the piston and the world has changed so what that means is is basically we're doing nearly six to eight hours worth of additional work uh to a set of cylinders and uh we can't very well charge for that so it's uh it's been a challenge my friend i appreciate you noticing that uh uh, Ed Zill, if Evo cylinders are honed, do you still use stock rings? I, I can't say certain. Uh, uh, mo more than likely not, Ed Zilla. More than like more than likely not, because you know we're, you got ring gap to be concerned with and all this type of stuff. It depends on how far they're honed. You know, if you're honing a thou or two, uh, really a ring is only good for a you know very slight oversize, a couple thousands, give or take. So if you're honing five thou over. I wouldn't use the same, you know, necessarily use a set of stock rings. Um, I wouldn't use, this, you couldn't use the same pistons either. So, uh, no on that. So, Chris, whenever uh, FedEx gets my parts to you, I want the 107 Pro Touring Kit. Currently, I have a PCV. What do you recommend uh, for the EPA puts a hammer down? Um, you know, the, with the PCV, I believe you're referring to the Power Commander 5. Uh, I, I'm actually a big fan of the Power Vision. I, I know how to use all tuning systems out there. One of the primary reasons that I'm a big fan of Power Vision is it does have, uh, you know, there's some bells and whistles it's got that's great. But, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, we, we have customers from all over the world here. And uh, that has it seems to have become one of the most common, uh, one of the most common tuning systems out there. Uh, it also, their tech support is really good. And, uh, you know, they do make the dynos and things like that. So, you know, if I put somebody in a tuning system or recommend one, if if they for whatever reason when they get the bike home if it needed to be tweaked or something needed to be done, uh, it's going to be easier for them to find a tuning center that uh, that I've as I have found in my research and who I know, it's going to be easier for them to find a someone that uh, is familiar with the PC five uh, or excuse me uh, or the Power Vision excuse me so I I would prefer Power Vision I guess over the PC five would it work sure. Um, it's it's really up to your tuner. The second qualification I would give would be uh, whatever tuning system your tuner, your the guy you choose to use to tune your bike, whatever system he is most comfortable with and most knowledgeable of would probably be one of the better ones to go with. 
um, you know, putting a, an, a piece of equipment in the hands of a guy that's not real familiar with it, um, not a great thing, right? Um, so let's let's just say I I, I wouldn't hand a a thousand dollar one pound slab of Kobe beef to a guy that's only you know flipped a hamburger at a fast food joint if that makes sense. So um, I'm doing our engines. It's NorCal. Yeah, it's a point of uh, tell us what we can and can't do. I, you know, to some degree, I, if if a person lives in a state where you know there is uh, emissions inspections required on motorcycles, and I don't think there's very many. I, I have, I don't know exactly how many, but I know none of the southeastern states require emissions inspections. So then those things shouldn't apply, you know. And if it's not a brand new motorcycle, you know, all those things, I, I don't really necessarily get it either. But that's part of it. Uh, Nick, you're welcome. Uh, Mr. Frank, glad to see you here, sir. Glad you made it. Uh, wow, we got a lot of questions that popped up, guys. Bear with me just a second. Uh, let me scroll through here. Uh, Nick, my opinion on welding stock crank going to bottom end. We just upgrade the crank since you're there. Uh, you know, Nick, it, it depends on current condition. You know, there's a few things that uh, that determine, uh, you know, what repairs need to be made, right? I mean, it, and one of those is current condition. If the sprocket shaft side is good where the splines and the center bolt are concentric to the center line of the crank, the pin shaft doesn't have too much wear on it, uh, then, you know, and you, and that crank can be trued and then balanced. There's no reason not to weld the stock crank. Uh, the, the, one of the thing comes is you got to also consider rods. You know, if you're planning on banging some higher PMs every now and then, uh, 07, they started using tapered top rods. You know, they get very, very narrow at the top and it depends on how you use your bike. Um, the narrower, the tapered top rods can produce some instability in the piston. So it could be if your flywheel halves are good, uh, pinion shaft good, sprocket side good, you go with an H-beam rod and you weld it, you plug it, you balance it. Um, there's no reason not to do that. Um, you know, that, that makes a very good option. And, and it can very well be a crank could last you for, you know, for forever. So uh, great consideration there. Uh, Patrick, you're welcome. Thank you very much, sir. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you, sir. John, um, had a lot of people ask, uh, you may not remember, but I've had a lot of people ask what cams are in my bike. Uh, John, I believe, if I can remember correctly, I believe I used a Redshift 576 in your bike. Um, that was a cam that we kind of worked with, uh, with uh, uh, Danny Fitz at Zippers to come up with. Uh, it wasn't in their catalog for a very long time, and then I think they added it uh, some time ago. But uh, the the thing about that cam is it's it's great for low to mid range torque. It's very friendly to the drive line. The ramps are a little softer, uh, but primarily it it's kind of custom designed for dual coil springs. You know, with that with how the ramp is profiled, and it's a great cam. It could actually be used in anything from a 95 inch at 10 to 1 all the way to a 124 at 10 and a half to 1. So it's uh you know it's a really good all around cam and I use it in all kind of engines um you know based on valve sizes, port designs and stuff. So maybe that'll help you there. Uh let's see. Uh Joe, uh with that cam though, wouldn't he need lifters, cuffs, a tuner, decat, replace header? Um uh, Joe, that's a great great thing. You know, I I Yes, I'm a big fan, and thanks for pointing that out, by the way. I'm a big fan of getting the plastic cuffs out of there. So that's a that's a great thing. Um, lifters, yes, it's it's good practice to put in a set of lifters anytime you replace a cam. And, uh, of course, tuner, decat, or replace header. I, if you plan on doing some, you know, a little more tuning on the aggressive side, again, outside that EPA compliance sort of thing, then getting the the cat out of the head pipe is always a good choice. Uh, it's not something you absolutely have to do, but there's compromises. Uh, let's see, uh, NorCal. When the rules come into effect, uh, will it be from that point forward? Yes, I, I don't think it'll be a retroactive sort of thing. Um, it, it's going to be basically from that point forward. 
but it, it's still up in the air. I mean, it, it may just be again a thing, pay a fine and then vanish, and for a few years and then it goes away. We've been through this before. It's not anything new. It's like stumping. I talk about right. Stumping ain't anything new. Shovelhead stumped all these other <laughs> engines. So it's one of those things folks are freaking out over. And uh, for us, from our perspective anyway, um, I hate the company that that was affected by it. I really hate that for them. But as a whole, for the industry, we'll we'll figure it out. We always do. And uh, all right, let's see what we got. More questions. Uh, Greg, what do you think about running an oil cooled oil pump on a waterhead twin cam? Interesting. So I, I'm assuming you're you're talking about running running oil cooled oil pump on a waterhead twin cam. Uh, it's an interesting question, Greg. Unfortunately, sir, I don't have an answer for you. Um, I'd have to think about that one for a little bit. I don't want to misguide you, so I, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, Jazz, I'll try this again. How safe is it to repair a pulley stripped out bolt using a Healy Coil kit as common practice at Harley Davidson that you know of? Uh, repair pulley stripped out bolt using a Healy Coil kit. I'm not, I'm not sure, Jazz, what uh, pulley you would be speaking of. Um, not sure what you mean there, bud. Uh, if you want to clear that up, maybe we can we can revisit it. I can tell you as a general rule, I'm not a big I'm uh, Healy coils do work, but I vastly prefer uh, time certs uh, over using Healy coils. So if there was a time cert available, that would be my choice, regardless of what uh, uh, regardless of which um, application that that was. Uh, Chris, you're welcome. Uh. 10, 000, let's see, Jay, there's another YouTube channel. I won't mention names. Thank you. We don't do that here. I appreciate that, sir. That claim without anything to back it up, the vast majority of 07 Up motors will fail a leak down test after 10,000 miles. Your thoughts? I, I can't say I necessarily agree with that because someone has to first define what failing is. All right. So let's say, for example, uh, on m 8s I believe that uh, the new standard for Harley on an M8 is 25% leak down or less is acceptable. So uh, someone would have to define what fail is. An engine can run with a considerable amount of leak down, 25, 30. It'll just be lower on power and build up excessive crankcase pressure. Uh, 3 to 4% leak down is an exceptionally healthy engine. An engine can run you know, as much as 10% or maybe even a little more, 10 to 12% leak down and uh, still perform very well and not produce any issues. But so, so much of this stuff is relative. And, and I, I hate when folks speak definitively when things have so many variables. So like, for example, the crazy engine I'm building for my FXR for Sturgis next year, next year, FXR 71, it's 120 cubic inch. Uh, the engine itself, monster valves, all this. The engine itself is close to 150 horsepower. Uh, then we had eight pounds of boost to it. Then we add nitrous. Well, because of all those things, you know, we're talking an engine that's 250 plus horsepower, but my ring gaps have to be enormous. The rings are fit rather loosely in the cylinder. That engine could have a leak down of 15 to 20 percent. It's still completely healthy. But as someone mentioned earlier, I believe it was George Spain asked the question about gas porting on pistons. Well, if I gas port that piston, it's also going to have an incredible leak down. It could be 25, 30, 35%. So it's all relative. Um, I, I can't say that. I've seen some 07 and up engines, 120, 30, 40,000 plus miles on them without tremendous leak down. So I can't say that I, as a de facto statement, that that uh, from my personal experience that uh, and all the engines I've been through over all these years that I could say that for for definitive. So, um, let's see. Uh, Journey of Jerry uh, seat for a fat boy different than other soft tail bikes. Uh, question first uh, fitting on the frame. Look for aftermarket seats for fat boy. Never find a fat boy seat on a website. Uh, the, the fat boy seats are unique themselves, just the pattern of it, but all soft tail, the soft tail frames are, you know, are the same. So, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, the fat boy, you know, it's tank and rear fender and they're virtually the same. Uh, so it's, it's just, a, well, unless you're talking like a soft tail deuce or, you know, some of the other, are uh, some of the other models out there. 
But uh, you don't really have to specifically look for a fat boy. If it's a seat for a soft tail, then you should be you should be okay there. Um, Chris, several tuners in Central Indiana, H HPI being one of them. That's a, a good spot to go. All right, so let's do a little bit of speed round to get us uh, get us caught up here. Um, so I'm not going to mention names. I'm just going to answer the questions. We'll do the speed round, and then, then that'll get us caught up a little bit. Um, Spigots just thick on new cylinders as the gym cylinders. Uh, yes, sir, they are. They're just as thick. And uh, let's see, Nick. Uh, thanks. You're welcome, Nick, for that information. John Frank, correct? Correct, sir. John Frank has a very, very long history as a machinist. And uh, so John Frank is is certainly one that uh, that is, is a he's a great fellow has an incredible wealth of knowledge. Difference between that and a five seventy five, Brian. If you're asking the five seventy five, five seventy six, it's ramp profiles that have a difference. Remember, I'd mentioned that, and so the specs are slightly different. I'd mentioned that that five seventy six was specifically designed for dual coil springs to be more friendly to the valve train, allow more longevity and stuff. So it's ramp profiles, slight differences on the specs. Uh, want free flowing exhaust for a two one M eight? Do I need to go the dyno standalone tuner work? Uh, it depending on if you're just doing exhaust and intake and you're getting rid of the catalytic converter, that is a that is a fairly radical change when you remove that catalytic converter. So uh, having some method, you don't have to go to a dyno as long as you have some method of checking air fuel ratios, be it with a uh, you know, if you're using a power vision, for example, you can use target tune, you can use the auto tune module. You know, you don't have to have a dyno. You just need, I would say, you know, bikes are expensive. A 21 bike M8, I mean, they're $30,000 these days. So it's worth, you know, paying someone that can verify the air fuel ratios and make sure it's safe with whatever modification you did. If you remove the cat, that is a major change. So I would recommend doing some sort of AFR analysis. Uh, Dominic, do I offer consult consultations? Look, moving to 114.17, try God, 131 crate track, good numbers. Uh, one of those mid. Dominic, we do uh, offer consultations. I do it for, uh, it's basically a one hour fee. It's equal to our labor time that's in the shop. And uh, yeah, I stay booked up on consultations, uh, you know, two, three, sometimes four weeks in advance. Uh, if you go to the Baxter's Garage website, uh, you will see a link for, and then it, I think it's, in there somewhere, it's about, you know, like Scott Series consultations or something like that. You can click there, give us the information, and then uh, 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 Jason, my GM, would reach out to you to schedule that consult. So, yes, we do do that. But when I'm the guy that does the machining and the building and the blueprinting, so, uh, you know, I have to find the time for it. Uh, let's see what we got. Rear wheel, thank you very much, Kevin. You're welcome. Wideband target tune. You, I like it. Duck Rider, yes, I, yes, I do, sir. It's a very accurate system. And uh, so I'm, I'm a fan of the wideband target tune system, also the auto tune system that they have. They're great. Uh, Steven Richardson did the Power Vision of the wideband kit. Be very, very close to yourself with some time. Yes, sir. That is correct. Slick 50, do you need another bottle of rum? Yes. <laughs> I always. Buddy, after a 74-hour work week, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you know, today's Sunday and I'm here. I, I, You know, I am going to take Monday off and not come to the shop. I'm going to stay home tomorrow and probably not do a darn thing. Of course, I say that. I get up at 9 o'clock and I'll probably want to come here to make some exhaust or foot controls or something. Uh, Larry Cook, traveling south next year. Be able to stop by for a quick visit? Sure, just let us know you're coming. Um, because, you know, I stay pretty hammered busy, my friend. And if I'm building an engine or machining an engine, I, I don't like to step away from it. I don't think that's fair to our customers. I like to keep focused and on what I'm doing um, and avoid interruption. So as long as we know in advance you're coming, then uh, we can certainly make some time for you, sir. It'd be a pleasure to shake your hand. Best way to re-gear an 07 Ultra. Ride two up in the wind, sick gear, just downshift. Uh, you know, there's a couple of ways you could do rear sprocket. You could also do up front, uh, you know, with your crank sprocket. Uh, and there's a handful of options up there, uh, out there with, uh, say, like going from a 34 to a 32 tooth. Uh, one of the challenges with that is uh, availability of a shim, if you will, to take care of the primary chain. 
slack. Uh, uh, there's because you're going to have more slack than your adjuster will allow for. Uh, one way that I like to do it is with, with a clutch basket that we actually source from Evolution Industries. And I believe it goes down to a 49 tooth clutch basket. And it also, that kit also comes with a primary chain. A little more expensive, but you're getting a better clutch basket and primary chain. So, you know, that that would be really, a, it's the more expensive route. But I think can, all things considered, that might be, you know, best option for you. Uh, Dalton. Uh, new to the channel, welcome, Doc. Glad to have you. There's a lot of guys have been here for a while, so uh, welcome, sir. Glad to have you. And uh, let's see, Gary Sign Loom. Let's see, sounds like a great plan. Take care of the family, Duck Rider. Oh, and here's my puppy. You guys want to see my puppy? Hey, buddy, come here. Come here. Let me get him. He's a lazy guy. Y'all want, buddy? Come here. Come here. Come here. All right. Let's look at this. Ah, uh, come here, you. Right, come on. Let me see. He weighs about 100 pounds. Let me see. <laughs> come on, put you stand up. What are you doing? He's shy, I guess. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, he's a he's a he's a uh, uh, Joe. Got to roll. You got it, my friend. Take care of yourself. Merry Christmas to you and family. And, uh, yeah, Buddy's in the house. He is a, uh, you know, Rhodesian Ridgebacks are interesting breeds. You know, they um, uh, they were, you know, their their bloodline goes back, I think it was like late 1700s, 1800s or something like that. And uh, they uh, were bred to hunt and exhaust lions in South Africa. So what they're known for is, you know, they've got this big broad ridge down their back, kind of like a, you know, a razorback, right? Their hair stands straight up along their back, which is kind of cool. Uh, Buddy is his name. And uh, so uh, they, they are, what they are known for is their, um, their athletic ability. So they can run um, absolutely wide open for like half an hour, 45 minutes. And that's what they would do. They would get together and you know hunting lions and they would keep running a lion until it exhausted itself and that's what they were bred to do so they they're they're not stubborn they're intelligent they like to think for themselves you got to make him think that something is his idea uh but they're absolutely brilliant dogs but the most fascinating thing about them one of their traits of the breed is they don't bark if they bark, you know there is a problem. I think I've only heard this dog bark in the year and a half I've had him. Uh, there he is. Come here. Come here. I think I've only I've only probably heard him bark a dozen times, but when he barks, it'll scare the crap out of you. It's insane. He's got this wolf-like growl to him. But he's a very handsome dog, and they're brilliantly intelligent. So uh, love kids and all that stuff. So they're really good dogs. Uh, Chris, you the African lion hound. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. George, Merry Christmas to you and as well, my friend, to you and your family. And uh, I don't know. I think he's... Buddy, come here. Come here. He likes to lay down. His his mama and his sister, they're, they're, uh, they decided to take a couple of days and go do something fun and give me a chance to work and do whatever. So he's kind of, uh, he's kind of lost right now that his, his mama... Ain't, ain't around and uh but anyway so uh sorry to digress guys so mike totally unrelated to the engine but i was thinking about having you install the legend shocks both front and rear while you have my bike in your opinion is it worth the investment uh thanks for asking that mike because as you know i i don't uh man i don't bull crap i'm just a straight shooter i, I tell you that one of the biggest things that you'll notice about improving especially the front suspension is a vast improvement in braking performance. You know, when, when you, you don't have as much suspension dive and all that, you're transferring, then all that energy gets transferred to the braking system. So there's a tremendous uh, improvement in braking alone, which of course is, is a safety thing. Um, and then, you know, as far as the rear, there's a lot of different price levels in that stuff. You know, if you're, if you're talking about Legends, uh, we also do stuff with Olin's. It takes a little longer to get. 
and then they'll custom spring them how you know based on your rider's weight and stuff like that and they are a little bit more expensive uh but uh you know you can do uh, two or three spring options with the legends on the rear but you know the the revo arc A's, i guess the ones that have the reservoirs uh, that's not something that the average rider really truthfully needs you know that's a 14 1500 set of shocks uh, but the the regular Revos that have the rebound compression adjustment and, of course, preload, that's a typical thing. Uh, you know, if you're doing that, uh, it, it does it, yes, it, it, you know, it really does. Um allows you to kind of dial it in. Um, it's, uh, I would have to say it is worth the investment. You know, anytime I've ever, even my own bikes, man, if, if I've ever bought a different bike, first thing I go at is suspension and braking. Suspension braking, and if I'm doing engine work, performance work, I always, you know, the suspension and brakes go with it. So I would say, if anything, yeah, a big difference in in your your braking capacity uh, is a big part of it. So you can't, you know, it's it's such an improvement. Yeah, you know, it's worth it. Do do I think you need to buy the absolute elite of everything that's out there? No, I don't. I, I because I, I I you don't need to spend the money for that because you're not racing, right? Uh, duck rider, eight-year-old Great Dane got a Keyshawn puppy. I'm not familiar with Keyshawn. That's interesting. So John, Mike Farber had him do the buying when he did regret best ever season did on the suspension. John, thank you very much, sir, for chiming in on that. Uh, Jason, and I changed shocks to external reservoir Olins. Whoops. No, Stephen, that's not a whoops. There's uh, the external reservoirs are not a bad thing. What that external reservoir is doing, you're you're you've got extra gas in the system. The shocks run cooler when you push them to their limit. All that stuff. The adjustments can have a little bit more uh, of an effect when you have that external stuff in there. Uh, so it, it there is it's just that second level. You know, it, it's it's buying a steak. You know, you can have a cut of beef, but it depends on where you get it cooked and how good the cow is, right? So that's a lot of that. And I know you're an aggressive rider. And so with with the bike that you've got, the engine that you've got in that thing, it's a powerhouse. You didn't go wrong with the upgrade, bud, because uh, I think you would use it to its full capacity. So uh, Brian has legends, thumbs up. Uh, noticed a huge difference in the front. No dive while braking, exactly. Um, better turns, so that's a big plus. Uh, John asks us, 2017 Breakout 103 Bone Stock Stage 1. What do you think of Jekyll and Hyde exhaust system like it loud on the highway, not in the neighborhood? The big thing about the Jekyll and Hyde exhaust system is that you're dealing with two vastly different systems when you do that. When you open that sucker up, the air-fuel ratio requirements would change. When you close it off, it's going to change. So, uh, you know, I actually, um, there's a company over in Japan that I went over in Shinjuku, just outside of Tokyo, and they were big proponents of that exhaust system. And and when I went over there, help you know, kind of worked with them to come up with a tuning system and a full wideband closed loop system that could Im- near immediately adjust when they open and closed uh, that bypass there. So it really just comes down to your tuning, what percentage of time you're going to spend on which end and that stuff. I have no opinion, pro or con, for that exhaust. If that's what you want, run with it. Just make sure it's tuned under both environments so uh, so it'd be good for you. NorCal, backfiring out of the air cleaner. Dark black spark plugs beyond a simple carb adjustment? Maybe not. Uh, you could just be incredibly rich. Uh, it could be a timing thing. I'm not sure exactly when that's happening to you, but it could be a simple carb adjustment. Uh, you can be so over rich, it can produce all kind of weird conditions like that. Um, Stephen Richardson, exactly. I need Kobe beef. I know it, buddy. Kobe beef. But you know what? There's this neat thing about it. Thing. Uh, I don't even think there's hardly any left. What, Gold Corral? All you can eat T bones for what, eight ninety nine? <laughs> if you put enough Heinz 57 or A1 sauce on it, they all taste the same. <laughs> Uh, Eddie, new to the crew. Love your videos. Thank you, sir, very much. Welcome. Everybody say hello to Eddie since he's new to us. Tapping sound. Notice no oil in the front cylinder intake push rod and rocker arm. Pump tap it. Let idle and the noise will come back. Try a new tap it. Same thing happens. 
Uh, if you've got no oiling to the top end, my friend, you have something certainly going on. It could be a very excessive lifter to bore clearance. You're bleeding off oil there. You could have a problem with a piston oiler uh, that is just pouring oil. Um, you certainly have a restriction for, for some reason there, my friend. Uh, I wouldn't run it much longer, uh, and you may just have to dig until you find it. Uh, Mike Farber, you are welcome, sir. Um, yeah, let us know, Mike, uh, on, on, on the options, uh, you know, with Legends and then also with Olins, and we'll, we'll help you find one that fits you, uh, you know, your needs, your budget, that sort of thing. We'll help you. John, which exhaust do you recommend for a Stage 1? Sir, so much of these bikes are about the look and the sound. The reality of it is I would recommend that you go to a bike rally or something like that, a bike night somewhere, and just stand around. Listen for people to pull, you know, pull in, pull off, you know, um, you know, bikes sitting there idling things. And when you find one that you like the look and the sound of, keep your passenger in mind, the heat on her leg, um, you know, keep, keep all that in mind. And then when you find one you like the look and the sound of, that's the one you're going to enjoy the most. Ask that owner what kind of pipe that is. That's the one that I recommend. Uh, let's see. What else? Man, we got all kind of questions coming. So thanks for, thanks for being here with us, Eddie. Uh, reach out to John next week, see what option will be best. Okay, Mike, thank you very much, sir. Uh, taste the same till the morning. <laughs> Code Brown, amen to that, Stephen. <laughs> Raider World, what's up, bro? Good to see you. Uh, Travis Calloway, my thoughts on a, uh, 21 cam for two up turning, 98 twin cam. Uh, I haven't run that one, but I haven't heard anything bad about it myself. Um, you know, if there's something that's just typically not good, I tend to hear about it. Um, that's one I've heard positive things. I, I don't, I don't necessarily see anything terrible about that one. So if that's the route you want to go, my friend, uh, you probably do well. Uh, Terry, Legends, you would definitely feel the difference. George, recommendation on tires for an 08 Fat Bob. Uh, Fat Bob, you ride fairly aggressive in the mountains of southeast Tennessee. You know, for high mileage, I am a big fan of the Dunlop American Elites. Uh, for high mileage, uh, if you're riding very aggressive, you know, that's when you start looking into, uh, you know, some of the, the Michelins with the real soft compounds and things. But but understand, you're, you're not going to get anywhere near the mileage. So there's a bit of a compromise between you know, traction, sticky, and mileage and longevity. Well, the the things I, one of the things I like about that American Elite is uh, it's a, uh, a, a dual compound type thing. They call it something else, but basically there's a little bit harder uh, compound in the center than there are on the edges. Uh, so you tend to get a great combination of mileage and traction in twisties. So uh, I, I'm a good fan. I'm a big fan of that one. Um, if, if you've got kind of a combo use bike there, Eddie, two thou clearance, all lifter bore, so lifters. So I'll check the piston oiler. Uh, two thou is not, I, well, I'd say this, Eddie, two thou is not enough necessarily to cause the issue you've got, but two thou is a little broader than I would like to see. Uh, because you got to remember that two thou becomes two and a half to three thou once the engine gets up to temperature, and that's uh, that's uh, that's kind of kind of getting out there. So uh, you might want to consider a half a one thou oversize uh, tap it on that. Uh, NorCal, awesome dog, killer man. Larry Cook, same with bars. Look at other bikes. Uh, test fit. Uh, let's see, NorCal, Line Hunter, that's amazing. Wish I could run nonstop for a half an hour. I know it. I do plan on getting back into triathlons. For you guys that have been with, with me for a long time, you remember I used to do, uh, do all the Ironman stuff. And, uh, when, um, you know, the big C hit, gyms were closed, events canceled, all that. And then we got crazy busy, so I haven't had a chance. But, uh, this, this, uh, puppy is the reason I got him. When I start running marathons and stuff again, he's going to be running with me. Uh, detonation for a few seconds from JP48 Pan for a few seconds rolling to throttle highway speeds. Six gear at 2,800 RPM. Uh, 
you know, man, I probably 2800 RPM six gear. If you're rolling onto it hard on a stock engine, that's a lot of load. I'm not surprised that you would hear some detonation. Uh, I would probably wait to 70, 75 miles an hour, give or take, before you roll into six gear. I know nothing about your weight, octane, your fuel, or anything like that. But if you're hearing a little bit of detonation, there you need to do two things. Downshift, which would remove some of the load from the engine thanks to gear multiplication or torque multiplication through gearing. Downshift, then roll on it is option number one. Number two, uh, have the bike tuned. Remove timing from that particular KPA area and RPM area. Uh, but you may compromise a little bit of power and torque response when you do that. So I would say, you know, 2800 RPM, six gear, you're running maybe 60, 65 miles an hour, maybe up to 70. It's a lot of load. So uh, maybe just downshift and roll through it or have it tuned. It's the best advice I could give on that. Uh, let's see, Raider World. It ran into any issues with Dynajet PowerVision O2 sensors. I had to disable the heated option in order for the engine light error codes to clear. Uh, that might be a base map issue. I haven't, well, I haven't had that problem that I couldn't correct. So you might need to update the base map on that. Um, there might be a, a like an 09 to 10 variance or 10 to 11. I can't remember exactly. <laughs> So you might have a base map issue on that. Kevin Small, good to see you, buddy. Uh, oh, I just flipped my my thing here, and I lost my space. I'll bear, bear, bear with me for a second. SNS 583, here we are, Kev. We're back. Uh, intake 5 and 18 degrees. Exhaust 5824. Claim is strongest from 15 to 5, which sounds perfect. I have an SNS 554 in NFL. We recommend 583 specs. Performance, thank you. Uh, you know, an 18 degree intake close is a relatively early intake close, so you're going to make up a lot of cylinder pressure. Uh, the 551, I don't remember the specs off the top of my head, but basically, you, as a general rule, you can look at it like this. If you close the intake valve earlier, you typically also shorten the duration. When you shorten duration, you also earlier intake close. You're taking your RPM range and moving it lower, your torque range and moving it lower in the RPM scale. So if you were to compare those, if it's a shorter duration and earlier intake close, you're going to take your cor cor torque curve and you're going to move it down. Um, so if your goal is low to mid-range torque, just having those two specs, not knowing exactly what lobe center line and all that sort of stuff is, uh, that uh, or duration, I would imagine the duration is probably relatively short, maybe somewhere in the 220, 230 range. Uh, that's a relatively low duration cam as well. So that's going to push all that power down low. So good choice. Um, let's see, Stephen. Uh, Night Dragons. Night Dragons by Pirelli. You're right, man. They don't last, but man, they're sticky. <laughs> they're sticky. So uh, uh, Michelin Pilots, yes. Uh, Brian. Uh, you have a 2020 Rogue Glide 131 per Dark Horse Crank. Realize the HD piston does not fit the Corilla rods. Where can I get a piston to fit? Um, I'm wondering why it wouldn't fit the the piston wouldn't fit the Corilla rod specifically. More than likely, what you may be referring to it could be a rod length variance, compression height of the piston. There's so many variables in this thing. Uh, it, you know, a stock crank having a taper top thin rod versus a Carrillo, which is going to be a race rod that's going to be a square top rod and not radius. There's so many variables in that, man. I, I can't really answer your question specifically. Target Tune's a good option, Raider. The Unlock American Elites are fantastic. Road Glide, I found the same. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I see you have oversized on your site. I'll be making a purchase. Name is pronounced just as Eddie. There we go. <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> Have a Merry Christmas, man. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Nick, for a home shop, what are some of the most important tools, machines, lifts, etc. to have? Uh, you know, I would start with the stuff that's going to keep you safe, Nick. If you can have, you know, lifts, engine hoists, things like that that are going to, uh, you know, reduce fatigue, things like that, I think that's a great place to start. Uh, I, I, it's, uh, I'm such a fan of the gym's tools because they work, they fit, they last forever. I've got tools from them that I have had since I started my career over 20 years ago, and I use them all the time. You guys know how many engines we do. I, I'm still working on the same cam bearing installers and pullers 
and and transmission main shaft bearing installers and pullers that I've had since day one, and you know how many we do. Uh, and if you ever had a problem, they got a lifetime warranty on their stuff. So I, I think you know the best advice on that is is look at the type of work that you plan on doing, and then spend and then you know spend the money and and, and buy the tools. Uh, and 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 a lot of times you you don't have to just buy a bunch of tools at once. You you could wait till a job comes in if you needed to. You know, uh, I'm not a big fan of going into massive debt when you don't know what's ahead of you. So you know you could wait till let's say you you don't know when you're going to get a transmission job. Well, wait till a transmission job comes in, and then buy your main you know your main shaft bearing tools and pullers and all that when the job comes in. It's the best advice I know to give my friend. Uh, hit the like button, just like Nick said. Thank you, sir. Um, Albert, there's no such thing as a silly question, sir. We will welcome any question here. Uh, so never be afraid to ask. Uh, my dog just groaned. He's not too happy with me right now. He's at work on a Sunday. Albert, might be a silly to some. I'm okay with that. I've always wanted to build an 88-inch Evo Sportster. Chain drive and carburetor for sure. My thoughts. Uh, you know, it comes down... Come here, buddy. Give me a second, guys. Hey, bud. I, I don't know what... Um, it, My friend, it's all up to you. I don't judge, buddy. It, it's, uh, you know, it's it's relative. The The... Further you get away from one horsepower per cubic inch, and the bigger that you want to build an engine, there is, you know, there's pros and cons. Uh, you know, you can build an absolute monster, but you have to be aware that sometimes those monsters require more maintenance. They may not last as long. There's several things. Um, I'm a big Sportster fan. I think they're wonderful bikes. I hate that they, the Evo Sportster got discontinued. <coughs> but the... Uh, I think it's awesome, man. Uh, build what you like, build what you love, and uh, go for it. I think it's just awesome. Um, chain drive, carb, go for it. Beat the fool out of it and enjoy it. That's what this motorcycle thing's about, man. So kudos to you for doing that. Uh, gear drive and man of war compensators. I do uh, Kool Aid. I do recommend uh, gear drive, absolutely, but it's based on the crank. You know, it's all about the crank. If the crank will fit it, provide you plenty of time for service, uh, you know, service life. It's under that three thou, all that type of stuff. And uh, and same with the Man of War. If the sprocket shaft side is in good order uh, and it'll work less than 10 thou there, uh, it's absolutely, if it's in your budget, certainly, uh, it's well worth it. Uh, late to the show. Happy Christmas, guys. Smiley, thank you for being here, sir. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, uh, Raider. Uh, head back to work, my friend. Um, all the best to you and yours. Thanks for joining. Nick, you're welcome. Kenneth, my crankcase is vented. Through transmission cover, does that eliminate flow through from the head breather element valves? Can these be eliminated? Has anyone ever experimented with this? I would not eliminate them. Uh, the The whole idea with this, this uh, secondary breather system the reason that it's required, venting your crankcase through the transmission, it's not a replacement for the head breather. It is providing assistance to the head breather. The problem is, is the engine may be creating, maybe, I'll say that, depending on many factors, creating more crankcase pressure through blow-by, uh, creating more crankcase pressure than the stock breather system through the head can handle. So by adding the transmission cover or the vent dipstick or whatever method you choose to do it, you are providing more opportunity to ventilate that crankcase. By eliminating the head breather, you're removing that. So I would uh, I'd keep the breather valve in the head, and I guess I'd leave it at that. And if you, if you find that your engine, your build, whatever the case may be, is benefiting from auxiliary or secondary crankcase breathing methods, then by all means do it. But one is not a replacement for the other. Um, on my FXR, I'll go back to that. That engine's going to be a monster. It's going to have not only the crankcase head breathers in place, it's going to have two 3 8 hoses coming out of each rocker box, and it's going to have a 3 8 hose coming out of the cam cover as well. Because that engine is going to have a tremendous amount of blow-by at peak RPM, 6,000 RPM on 8 pounds of boost when I hit the nitrous. So you got to plan for those things, right? Michael Jones, I'm making him buy tools. Yes, sir. Wife loves her 48. 
48s were very cool. I love the fat tire on those things. Those bikes handled like a dream. Uh, is there a downside to solid push rods? No, sir. There's no downside at all. Uh, it, it depends on your engine modification, what you're doing. Um, and it does kind of remove your ability to find the sweet spot of the tappet. You know, sometimes, you know, there's a sweet spot, be it like 80 or 120 thousandths down of that plunger travel to find that sweet spot for them to be really quiet. So running a solid push rod removes your ability to do that. But there's pros to them too. They're a little bit lighter. Uh, you don't have to worry about them coming loose, so it's it's a balance, you know, just like with anything. There's there can be compromise on on both sides of things. Uh, so, Larry, advice on installing dark horse comp never started better. Do you have that neutral rattle in the trans after warmed up? Will using a heavier trans fluid help with that? It possibly could. Uh, it possibly could. Uh, uh, Eighty ninety or a seventy five one forty uh, could help with that as well. Um, so fantastic. Glad it worked out for you, Larry. Uh, head turning bikes. Fun, fun, fun. Steven, I'm a Sportster fan. Adventure Genesis. Glad you chimed in. Just did a job with chain drive 551 cams. Excellent. That's a good choice. Merry Christmas to you, sir. Thank you again for your support over all this time. You've been with us for a long time. Uh, Steven, had a choice. Transmission cover breather is better than the dipstick. The dipstick is too, too, is easy. It's too hot. I, I agree with that. That's why I like the cover. I like the fact that it's got a reed valve in it. I know the thing's a little more expensive, but it's a really, really nice piece. Nick, as you guys know, Nick Trass is a good friend of mine. They put a lot of research into that thing, and, and they uh, they did a good job with it. Um, and so uh, I, I'm a fan of it. I like it. And then you don't have to worry about touching a hot dipstick. Uh, let's see. Do valve springs wear out, and is it possible to uh, over spring pressure the valve train? Yes, sir. It absolutely is. Um, valve springs can wear out over the time. They can lose their tensile, but it but it it can take a lot of time for that to happen. Uh, if the slightest bit of rust, the slightest bit of inclusion on one, a scar, a, a scrape, a scratch, can turn into a break relatively easily. That's one thing to think about. But you can absolutely overspring pressure one. Uh, it puts excessive wear on the valve stem to guide, excessive wear on the seat to the valve, and can create a tremendous amount of parasitic loss uh, in the engine. The other thing it can do is over accelerate the wear between the lifter and the cam, the rollers and the bearings in the lifter. Uh, all kind of things can happen. So there's uh, you know there's a range, but it's something you have to be mindful. You can't go too much. Uh, Richard Boggs joined us. Hey, hey from Ohio, Richard. Uh, you'll enjoy uh, Richard's one of those that I just finished boring his cases. You, if you guys do a little bit of following from I me mean, on other places, you just see we. Uh, that's what my seventy-four hour work week was about. Was finally having uh, having these in hand. Which, if you haven't, Richard, watch the beginning. <laughs> I talk about cylinders. <laughs> you'll know all about that, but I go into a deeper explanation on that. So. Uh, we've been hammering away on cases. So glad you made it, for, made it, Richard. Uh, t t going to do a trans cover for the twin cam. I, mm, I don't know about that. Um, they may not have to, uh, only because the twin cams, most of them weren't that big, uh, that high compression is in the M8s and stuff. And they didn't have that much of an issue with the twin cam. So I don't know if they'll do a trans cover for that or not. I guess I'll have to ask Nick. Uh, Robert, you and Johnny, from the west coast of Canada. Uh, cheers, eh? Isn't that right, eh? <laughs> Minus 15 Celsius. Goodness gracious. So that's 40 below zero, give or take? Isn't it something like you double it and add 30, add double it and add 20 or something, but it changes after under zero? That's like minus 40 degrees Celsius, Fahrenheit. Good grief. Thanks for joining us. Uh, see you, Stephen. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever it is you celebrate, my friend. Festivus for the rest of us, whatever it is. <laughs> Glad you made it, pal. We'll see you real soon. Uh, NorCal, Twin Cam Spark Plug Gap, normally aspirated, et cetera, et cetera, all that. Uh, I am a 40 thousandths guy. I set them at 40. Uh, Robert, first live Q&A. You have a 2014 103 first owner Woods 777 inmate lifters, fuel motor push rods, target tune notification, they change valve springs. Do I need new springs? Uh, I can't answer that specifically. 
I, I'm not 100% certain on the cam specs of the 777. Uh, that would be a question for Woods. I would recommend calling them. Uh, John, you're welcome, sir. Merry Christmas to you and yours. Thanks for being here. Uh, Richard, yeah, go back to the beginning. The first thing I talked about was cylinders. I think it'll be quite an eye-opener for you, for, for you, my friend. Uh, but uh, um, thanks for being here. Northeast Arkansas. Arkansas. Uh, let's see. If you're from Northeast Arkansas, uh, I've got good friends at Rodney's Cycle House in Little Rock. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Donna and Rodney Roberts at... Uh, at uh, Rodney Cycle House. If you're ever in the area, stop by, see him, make sure I said hello. Uh, Adventure Genesis, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate the kind words. Appreciate you Appreciate you being here. Uh, Adventure, best place to learn. Good man. Uh, 15 Road Glide, looking to do motor work. Not sure what size to go with. Between 107 and 110, not a hot rod or more torque based motor. What is your option? Man, here, Ryan, there are so many options. Nearly limitless, my friend. Um... You know, we could do a console if you wanted to. If you check out the website at baxtersgarage.com, I do charge a fee for that because it is an hour of time and an hour away from other things. Uh, but, uh, you know, we could talk about that and and I can answer any question you got, make some recommendations to you, and then if we do business together, then, of course, we would uh, refund you that uh, consultation fee there. Um, but if that's something you want to do, just hit baxtersgarage.com and we can have, that's a long conversation or I would I would answer you quickly. Uh, John Johnson, yes, sir, they are great people. Curious on your backlog. If I were needing an engine rebuild, how long does it usually take to get mine in and get it worked? Larry, at this point right now, we're running about uh, 18 months uh, with our waiting list. 18 months, possibly a little longer. Uh, so we've got quite an enormous backlog of people all over the planet, and we're going as fast as we can go. So uh, what we are doing at this point is ordering parts in advance to avoid it, impending price increases. We make sure we have the parts on the shelf uh, for you, reserved for you. And then, uh, you know, as, as time allows and, and is when we can get things out, that's when we call folks and have them bring their bike. So, uh, hello from, oh, from France. Richie's Polishing. Thanks for joining us, my friend. Uh, from Frigid, Montana. Goodness gracious. Uh, Eric, uh, Iridium or Standard NGK? Um, I, are you are we speaking M8 or twin cam? Not sure which one we're talking about here. Uh, for M8, I would go NGK. If we're talking twin cam, I would stick with a standard copper core, uh, auto light or stock Harley uh, 6R12. That, that's uh, my take on that. Fitting crankcase to exhaust port cat. Old hot rod of mine. I've tried that many years ago, starred face, star face. Many many years ago, the uh, and what I found was the crank pulses. We didn't. We were so close to the port, to the exhaust port, and the crank pulses and all that stuff. It really didn't help. If anything, it it uh, it created pressure. The exhaust pulses in the crankcase. Um, so that it didn't work for me. The exhaust just isn't really long enough, and and the uh, exhaust pulses aren't consistent. Um, so maybe that helps you with that. Use twin cam, cam plate, oil pump tensioner. Should I do a cam at the same time? It's up to you, Mark. Uh, it's whatever you want to do, bud. The, uh, you know, if it's in your budget, keep in mind, if you do a cam, you got to tune it too. Um, so there's, you know, if your stock cam bike performs the way you like it, leave it as it is. Don't spend the money. You know, a set of cams are $350, 400 bucks these days. Then you got to consider tuning in on that as well. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, Dave, welcome. Um... Dave's one of our members. With the oil path around the exhaust ports on M8s, have you ever thought of bypassing, removing this possible control temp of the way? So it needs pure, pure looks tidy up bigger than the engine. Dave, that's a good question. Um, one of the one of the concerns I've had with that is if you remove or bypass that, then what you now have is a cavity that is full of nothing but air. And, you know, the walls in that area can be relatively thin. Can I say that I have absolutely tested this and can confirm either way? No, sir. In, in all honesty, I can't. Uh, but my concern is now having that air cavity in there acting almost as an insulator, if you will, kind of like, uh, you know, that's how double pane glass works, right? So you now almost have an insulator. I wonder if it would contain heat. Uh, one of the things about that port not being there is you now have material that acts as a heat soak to pull heat away. 
So my concern would be with that material that's left between that open port and then the uh, port itself, the exhaust port, and that overheating, potentially cracking or something like that. Uh, that would be my concern on that. So, uh, but I haven't tested it, but that's that's where my head is taking me, right? So, Tim Russell, Merry Christmas to you, sir. Thanks for joining. Uh, John, Merry Christmas. Love your channel. You got 10 gigs on my smartphone so that I can watch you on the road. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate it, sir. Um, I have no idea why my puppy's in there whining. He may need to go for a walk. Of course, he did. I will say this. I walked into the shop just before I got started. And he pooped in the shop. <laughs> So he may need to go out or he may just be lonely. He likes to whine. He loves people. He loves people. Uh, Nick, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. 2023 plans yet? You know, Nick, uh, focus, buddy. Um, you know, we've got, again, we've got all kind of cool stuff coming for the channel. Uh, restorations, engines. You know, I really want to dive in more uh, and expand. Like I mentioned at the front of the video, you know, expand on what we're doing and let you guys see, because I, I know you guys, I know our most popular engine, our, our most popular videos are the engine teardown videos. You know, that's the reality, but, you know, there's so many other aspects to motorcycles and tearing down engines, right? So, I, I you know, I want you guys to see everything, the creative side of things, the development stuff, the, you know, all that. And um, so that's a large part of that in 23, I think, is what's coming. Thanks for asking. Adventure. Uh, tuning watch video on tuning. When I get my bike put back together, must I have a tuner prior to starting it? Uh, can't do what you do, so fuel pack for me. Um, you know, I guess it depends on how far you're going with the build. You know, doing a quick fire up just to make sure everything's okay is not too bad. It's not really going to hurt anything, but I don't know if I'd necessarily take off down the road and go for a long ride. You know, you can... Fire the thing up and just kind of go for a quick ride. Look at your plugs, head temperatures and stuff. But, man, it's hard for me to give you advice if you don't have some way of verifying air-fuel ratio. You know, I, I don't want you to to, to damage that engine um, it, without knowing. You know, too lean, a little bit of detonation can break rings and pistons, affect ring seal. That first 30 to 40 miles you run a bright bike during that break-in period is critical. Um so I, you know, I, I give some thought to it, bud. Uh, Mike Farber got to go to work. Honeydew list. Merry Christmas, Mike. Thank you again for being here, my friend. Thanks for your support. All the best to you and yours. Uh, great, great channel. Lots of info. Took notes for friend, and it has paid off. Love the channel. Merry Christmas, sir. Merry Christmas, Greg. Thank you for being here, Nick. Any chance you're Headed to 2023 Smokeout. I will certainly be at the 2023 Smokeout. Uh, I also just planned uh, to go to uh, the Donnie Smith Bike Show there in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul in March. So I know I'll be there. And uh, I may start announcing too, uh, as work allows, of course, like I said, customers come first, as work allows, uh, to um, you know maybe schedule some meet and greets at some various different places. You know, it might be a fun thing to do. So, Randy, um, uh, 2022 Electric Glide Standard Stock Everything Motorcycles as fast as I need. What's the most important thing I should do to this motorcycle to make the engine last? Uh, keep an eye on your services. Make sure your services are done well. Um, just pay attention to the bike. If you notice anything change, any, you know, keep an eye on your air filter. If you notice a lot of oil pouring in there, notice uh, oil consumption changes. If you, you know, start noticing big heat changes, it's just pay attention to your bike. And if you notice a change, don't accept that's normal, right? If you notice a change, that means something changed. Uh, you know, detail your bike. When you're detailing it, look for small things, you know, your hands on fasteners, roll your fingers over washers if any bolts come loose, you know. A lot of it is just about paying attention. Uh, take a look at your spark plugs every now and then. You know, take mental notes. I think that's a that's a lot of it. Um, and, uh, that you know, that's really the best advice I could, I could give. Just pay attention to your bike. Don't treat it like a car. Don't just get on it, hit the switch and go. 
uh, you know, pay attention to it. And I, th I think that's a good choice, uh, a good thing to do. Transmission teardown videos. Um, I've got several out there. Um, and I've got several out there. I did a complete rebuild for the, let's see, the Gems Tooltech Tuesday stuff. I did a complete rebuild on a cruise drive. I did a Baker install. Uh, and so I don't remember if I've done any five-speed stuff. I think I did a lot of six-speed, but... Uh, doing some five-speed and even some four-speed cow pie transmission, that sort of thing. A, a lot of that is what's coming next year with the shovel head, the Evo, and all that build. So there's some of that coming, but um, I've got some transmission stuff out there. Uh, Kevin Small, we're going to go for just a few more minutes, guys. I think I'm wearing down. My dog's going crazy. It's about 1.30. We've been going straight for an hour and a half, so we might uh, cut, it, cut it a little bit short. I'm starting to wear down, guys, but let's get everybody taken care of first here. Uh, you have an inch nine, inch 900, inch 585 valve, beehive spring, max 650 lift, 178 AV and V, valve noise is dominant when cold and low with the 550, loud valves, worry me, bike runs great, should I be concerned? It's hard for me to answer that, Kevin, because it, it's relative, right? Um, uh, a, bee, a beehive spring would typically run a little less seat pressure than what a dual coil spring would. AVNV makes good stuff. Uh, 178 pounds of seat pressure is quite a bit of seat pressure. Uh, but um, that's what may be required to keep from floating a valve if you're actually running 650 lift. That's a lot of lift. You know, you could run, you know, on an inch 900 AVNV valve. Uh, if you were running, say, 585 to 600 lift sort of cam, you could get away with 160 pounds of seat pressure uh, and probably be okay. Um, so that's that's a, a pretty good amount of seat pressure there. Uh, it, it may be more spring than you need for cam. I don't know the exact cam lift on the 551. Uh, but anyway, you know, it, it's... Uh, when you take a big valve, you put a big cam with it, and you run a lot of seat pressure, they're going to be noisy. That's just a, that's just how it is. It's just kind of how it works. Um, so I hope, hope that helps you a little bit, Kevin. It's hard for me to give you an exact answer. Um, NorCal, yeah, no, that cold weather. Man, that's some cold stuff. Uh, let's see, Francisco, Merry Christmas to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I might be able to make it to the 2023 Motorbike Expo in Verona. I might. I'm hoping. A lot of that depends on my wife. I don't like to go over there if my wife's not with me. So uh, um, it, it depends on that and kind of what all's going on at the time. But uh, if I'm there, Francisco, uh, I'll certainly make the announcement. It'd be nice to meet you. Nap time, Michael Jones. Good to see you, pal. Mr. Boggs, Merry Christmas to you and your family. Sir, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, we are um, JP48 Pan. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, El Veo Gonzalez. Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad, my friend. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, Gary, I'll answer these couple of questions real quick, guys, and then I'll bounce out of here. Gary, thoughts on pulling a cargo trailer? I'm not a fan of that, sir. Um, I, that's that's your choice in, in, entirely, but I'm not a fan myself. Uh, Terry, Merry Christmas to you and family. Thank you very much. Uh, in the garage. Thank you, sir. Thanks for being here. Uh, Ron Hunter. Hi from, hi from here. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Ron. Thank you for your support. Being a member, Ron, you've been with us a very long time. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Lee, thank you, sir. Uh, you're welcome. Um, Kenneth, how much should I worry about loose piston oilers? A lot. That can be a big problem. Um, uh, it's, they can't leak and they have to work. That's the reality. Um, a duck, look forward to doing your 124. Okay, guys, I'm going to ask just so nobody's questions goes unanswered. Uh, you're welcome to leave comments after I sign off, Dave. Uh, good day, Mike. Uh, glad to have you. Um, you you guys are welcome. Anybody that's just signing in, if you didn't get your question answered, you're welcome to leave a comment. I will address those comments. Uh, and I want to, before I sign off, I want to say a few things, if you guys don't mind, get personal for a minute. Um, thank you, really. Um, it, it's been a crazy year, the past couple of years. 
uh, so many of the members, you subs, your comments. I, I wish I could answer all your questions and your comments on the videos. Uh, but I, I have choices to make. And, um, you know, heart to heart here, um, uh, work, working the kind of hours I've been working, trying to maintain the quality level that, that maintaining, you know, this 60, 70 plus hour week stuff and, and still trying to have time for, for my wife and my daughter and, um, you know, just some time. I, I just, I, I wish I could answer all these questions for you guys, the comments on the videos and stuff. It just comes down to it. I just don't have that much time. Um, uh, so it, it's a matter of priorities. So, um, I'm looking forward to next year. Uh, I will tell you there are some very exciting things coming next year that I'm very excited about, and, and I look forward to sharing those things with you guys uh, and being a part of, um, you know, being more of a part. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky to have you guys in this. You know, again, all you members that support what we do every single month, thank you. Uh, the subs for hanging in there with us and all the positive comments, you know, it drives us and, and it keeps me going. Um, it's motivation, if you will. And and I want to thank all of you for that. And you know, it's um you know, for me this time of year, I I I celebrate Christmas. Um I don't care if you I don't care if, if you if you celebrate Han Hanukkah, I don't care if you celebrate you know, Kwanzaa, I don't care if you celebrate Festivus or whatever it is that you do this time of year. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I choose Christmas. Your choice may be different. Your choice may be nothing at all. And, you know, it's just this time of year, family, friends, appreciating what we have, the gifts that we have. I think it's important. And um, I wanted to let you guys know before we, you know, we, in years past, we've done, we've always done a Christmas fundraiser. And, uh, you know, we did the bikes, you know, the bicycles for kids and stuff like that, profits from t-shirt sales and stuff. Um, and, and it's been wonderful every year. Uh, this year has been so hard. Um, basically what we were able to do, we did help. Um, we were able to t-shirt sales. I did take the profit from the t-shirt sales and that allowed us, uh, and then I did some matching, uh, on that as well. And that allowed us to, uh, we donated, uh, uh 500 bucks to Toys for Tots. And Rodney Roberts, I'd mentioned Rodney earlier at um, Rodney Cycle House uh, there in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, if you want to know who they are, if you go back, look a couple of videos back, I went and visited them and talked about this. But they've been, for 30, 30 years, I think, they've been doing a big Toys for Tots thing. So uh, we took, for those of you that have bought shirts and things, we, we took that and donated $500 to Toys for Tots. But we did do that for Christmas this year. Proud to be able to do that. And so... But anyway, that said, guys, I think um, um, I think I need to take a break. Um, I'm just tired. Um, I'm tired, and I'm not here to complain. I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, but uh, we're gonna. Uh, I'm gonna close the shop for the week from Christmas to New Year's, and uh, I need to spend some time. Um, I need to spend some time with my family, um, my wife, my daughter, and all that. Um, so I'm going to sign off for uh, for the rest of the year, I guess, um, and then take Christmas to New Year's and and regroup and 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 spend that time. You know, so for all of you customers that are waiting, um, I'm going as hard as I can go, and uh, I promise I'll make my commitments and. Um, and we'll we'll get you going as quick as we can right on the challenge. And I want to say thanks to all of you again. I appreciate who you are. I appreciate what you do. I appreciate your encouragement. And uh, guys, let's get ready for 2023. We're gonna have for all of you that are still on here right now. There's 137 of you on here right now. Get ready. <laughs> oh man. 2023 is going to be awesome, and I'm really, really excited about it for many, many, many reasons. So, everyone, again, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Hanukkah, Festivus for the rest of us, or whatever it is that you celebrate this year. Please do it with friends and family and loved ones, uh, and be thankful for, for whatever we have. So, uh, guys, thumbs up. Thank you so much for everything, and... Uh, 
wish blessings to all of you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. We'll see you again soon. Be safe.